test two. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a customer phoning a company representative to complain about her new purchase. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, is this the Dynamo Motorcycle Company? Yes, it is. How can I help you? Well, I have an instruction manual here for your new electric motorcycle, but I'm not satisfied with the purchase at all. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but don't worry. I'm sure we can sort this out. Before we do anything, can you tell me the model number? Ah, at the top of the instruction manual here, it gives the model number R T Y three four. Uh, T Y three four. Okay. Now, what's the nature of your complaint? It's many things, actually. The biggest problem is that you say in your manual that the battery will take the motorcycle thirty kilometers. That's right. Well, it's lucky to take me eight. The battery is usually flat by then, often leaving me stuck at the side of the road. Are you sure you're charging it correctly? I'm fairly sure. I follow all the instructions and plug it in for a long time. And are you sure you charge it for the required three hours? I charge it until the charging light goes off, and that's two hours, so that should be enough. And there's a serious design fault with this motorcycle. When you're riding it, there's no meter to show you how much power is left, so you actually don't know when the machine is going to stop working. There's a voltage gauge. Yes, but that tells you nothing. The needle fluctuates about from fifty-five to forty-five, so whatever it says is meaningless. According to the manual, you're meant to charge the battery if the needle falls under fifty volts. But even when you charge it, it can go below forty-five. As I said, the needle just waves all over the place. The result is that I'm always worried that the bike will leave me stranded in the middle of nowhere. Well, I'm sorry about that. Sure, but what are you going to do about it? Unfortunately, we don't have a refund policy. But if you take the bike to one of our shops, our mechanics will look at it. Perhaps there's a problem that we can fix. The gauge, for example. The other problem is the battery. I actually weighed it, and it's almost six kilograms. Yet you say in your manual that it weighs only three. I can barely pick the thing up, so it's not three kilograms at all. Maybe you purchased the wrong model by mistake. I doubt that very much. Basically, I think I've been defrauded, and I'd like to know what you're going to do about it. All right, I'll put you through to our complaints department. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Hello. 
complaints department here. Uh, apparently, you have a complaint. Yes, I do. Let me tell you all about. It's it's all right. Our representative has already informed me about your problem. It's probably just a misunderstanding. I'm sure we can work something out. Right now, I need to take down some details. All right. Can I have your name, please? Jesse Parkinson. That's J E double S I E and Parkinson, P A R K I N S O N. Parkinson. All right. What shall we list this complaint under? Parts, service, or performance? Well, the meter isn't accurate at all, so that's parts, isn't it? Yes, perhaps, but you do feel more generally that the motorcycle doesn't meet the operational standards as advertised. So it's probably better to tick performance here. Can we tick both parts and performance? No, we can only tick one. So let's not call it parts. We'll go with performance. Now we may post some further forms and questionnaires to you. So would you mind giving me your address? Certainly, it's forty-five Melrose Road. Melrose, M E L and Rose. Okay. Now your phone number. Just use my mobile phone. That's o nine two eight nine eight two four five three. Four five three. Okay. And if we have any follow-up questions, what time is best for ringing you? Morning, afternoon, night time. Well, I work as a secretary from nine to five, but I do get a lunch break, which gives me some free time. This break used to be twelve thirty to one thirty, but then it changed to an hour later. So it's best to ring me at two p.m. since the break now starts at one thirty. All right,、uh, that's all for now. We just need to do our own investigation, and we'll probably ring you back tomorrow. I'm sure we can get to the bottom of this. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hello, everyone. Now here you all are, new university students, and the first question you probably have is, "What is a student union?" Another question is, "Do I have to join?" Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated. And this university responded: "So, joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you. Although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join, since." All students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left, and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints, and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. 
Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question. What are we? We are a formal organisation, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises and organise ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well, the student union organised all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions and, as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, let me tell you more about the Student Union and its basic functions. In general, there are three, social, organisational and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear, in other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to 20% discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. Alright, let's move on to our more serious functions which are helping you get through life here as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue, if you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So, just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two teachers talking about the work experience program for their students. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, we've got to arrange this programme. Work experience. I believe quite strongly in this myself. Studies are often just too theoretical and the best learning can be on site. Sure, in principle, but you've got to find the right companies. For business students, it's so easy with all the commercial enterprises around here, but for our lot of engineering students, it's not so easy at all. Last year's education students were easy too. We just put them all into schools. Well, there are a few companies that will accept our students. Building sites are the main avenue to explore, but the trouble is that not many of these places want inexperienced learners around. Why not? Last year when I did this, I think these companies were worried about accidents. Now it's more a time issue. They just don't want to train people. But these people work for free. But training takes time, and in the economic recession, few companies want their personnel diverted for such purposes. But I did find some companies, enough for us at least. But they all insist on one thing. Minimum work time of one month, right? No, that the students are appropriately insured. Remember, these are building sites and there are quite a few hazards there and we're putting untrained students, not trained students, right amongst them. So these companies want financial coverage in case of accidents. Gee, is that going to be expensive? Yes, I'm afraid so, since we live in quite a litigious society. Consequently, insurance rates are sky high, almost unaffordable. I see. Can our budget meet this? Last year we couldn't pay for the programme. This year we can, since we have fewer students to deal with, but we'll nevertheless have to cut corners in certain areas. Hmm. I never like it when that happens. Neither do I. In which areas do we need to economise? Well, the payment to students is not going to change. After all, they won't do this work unless they can get some money. We'll also continue to subsidise their travel as we did last year. Last year we gave them a completion bonus too. It was a big success. Made them go through the whole month. But not this year. We'll impress upon the students that possible failure could result if they don't finish the whole term. OK, I trust that will work. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. The most important issue for me about this work experience programme is which companies are getting involved, and that was your job. What companies did you find? Right, four companies are prepared to help out. Heppelwhite Distilleries, AJ and Sons Engineering, Johnson Demolition and Sansoni Security. How many students can they take? Heppelwhite can take five, no, six. Six? Sorry, sorry, five. It's limited at the moment by the winter, since beer drinking is lower around this time. As for AJ and Sons, that would be seven. Last year it was 17. Not this year, I'm afraid. Ah, the other two places are six and six, which makes up everyone, 24 of them. Right. What about starting dates? Ah, uh, that's the problem. They cannot all start and finish on the same date, which makes this a little hard to dovetail with the academic semester. Heppelwhite can accept its cohort around August 15th. 
AJ are a little later, starting five days later, in fact. The twentieth. Actually, the twenty-first is what they said. And the other two? The demolition company can start earlier. The start of the month, the first, and the security firm will start three days later on the fourth. Okay, that sounds good. And will all our students work for one month? Well, remember, it doesn't have to be a full month, but just long enough to meet syllabus requirements. So, how long is Hepplewhite going to use these students? They said three weeks, maybe four weeks, if we want it. We want it. Tell them the longer option is necessary. Sure, sure. I think they'll accept that. The students will probably buy some of their product, which will make the owners happy. Ah, as for the engineering company, it's giving twenty-four days. That's fine. And the demolition company? Ah,、uh, they're saying two weeks, fourteen days. Impossible. The students can't complete their projects in such a short time. You'll have to be stronger. Tell them minimum eighteen days. All right. The owner seems reasonable. He'll probably accommodate us if I throw in a few incentives. That leaves the security company, which is offering. Let me guess. Uh, three weeks, twenty-one days. Almost twenty-two. Ha! <laughs> I was close with my guess of twenty-one. Just one day off. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex or T. rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact: almost every one of those T. Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have twenty sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realise an obvious fact. Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes. But it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions thirty-four to forty.
Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. So, given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilize and from the skeleton alone, we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilization is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilized and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the earth for a long time and the longer, the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. And being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact, one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T. rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.